Hold on to your butt. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to episode 114 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Once again, I'm joined by Mary, a woman who is spending the end of her summer driving by school kids at bus stops and pointing and laughing at them. I am merely a broken lunchbox named Darren. What? Hey, Mary, how are you? Why are you always a broken something? Ah, because that's just the way I am. I'm a damaged soul. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I, I don't know. I guess I'm okay. It's a long weekend. We got college football starting. My my alma mater, Boston College, starts tomorrow, and they're going to disappoint me greatly as always. But the hope springs eternal. They have not lost yet, so I'm going to appreciate the uh, the good times. How about yourself? Um, well, yeah, same. I mean, I cheer for Boston College as well. And it's a long weekend. I start back to school next week. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> back to school we'll be pointing you laughing at the bus stop here pretty soon at least i don't have to take a bus that is true that is true well i'm going to be a gracious host that i'm going to get this started right i'm going to ask you what are you drinking on this holiday long weekend i am drinking full contact by alicia and um it's a well it's an imperial ipa and it's by alicia 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 brewing company which is i think based out of seattle anyway it's out west somewhere which is it, it's really good beer um and i'm drinking it out of like the, just a generic civil war mug because battle we're about to talk about i don't think there's any souvenirs for it because it's just that no. small of a battle and what are you drinking probably not oh thanks for asking me i, I honestly didn't think you were gonna ask this time i'm likewise drinking elysian because that's what i bought at the store yesterday so you're welcome it is called contact haze and I'm drinking out of my generic maroon mug as well. Isn't that a Boston that's College like mug? It is, but it, just like my um, my fandom, it's all scuffed up and destroyed from years of losing. So anyway, that's what, what, what I am. So speaking of losing, we're going to talk about an interesting battle tonight, Mary. And uh, you know we're going to go way back to the beginning of the war and talk about a battle that's really kind of gone under the radar. And that, of course, is the Battle of Cheat Mountain. And this is in Western Virginia in September of 1861. Mm -hmm. Now, what's significant about this battle is it marks the first appearance on the battlefield by one Robert Edward Lee Mary. Yeah. Contrary to later his later reputation, you know, this is a very different R.E. Lee and one that will find himself the subject of scorn by many in the South coming into this and exiting this one. Yes, it, it's a very, like, nobody talks about Cheap Mountain, so it's fought twelve to 15, uh, September 12th to 15th, 1861, um, and it's part of the West Virginia campaign. It's also known as the Battle of Cheat Summit Fort, and battle, I don't know if you study it, some people might think, well, why is it called a battle? Because it's not, like, it's not on the scale of a battle, obviously, of like a Gettysburg or a Chickamauga or even, like, a Franklin or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a very big battle there's not very many men fighting there but it is kind of where you know you see the introduction of robert e lee but on the union side you also have uh general joseph j reynolds you have uh general or colonel at the time nathan kimball who we're going to be talking a little bit more in this episode um but yeah this is where lee comes in and his reputation is not what it is at the end of the civil war which is very interesting and i think it's a part of um the history and the historiography, I guess you could say, of General Lee that doesn't get discussed a lot, the fact that he wasn't liked to begin with. And that's the way, there's a few figures in the Civil War like that that aren't well liked to begin with and at the end of the war they are. And then there's ones that are very well liked at the beginning of the war and by the end they're not. No, this is one of those things where it's sometimes you almost get the, the impression that, you know, Robert E. Lee joins the Confederacy. He turns down the job for Winfield Scott, and suddenly he rides on a white horse and, and, and just takes. He was disliked at the beginning, and you know if Robert E. Lee, the, the the fans of Robert E. Lee could could look back at how he started in real time, they'd be amazed at it. Mm -hmm. So we should just so let's we'll take it back to the beginning here just to set the stage with this. So during the spring of 1861, the wars were just getting started. And a lot of states were jockeying for position in regards to what their intentions were going to be. Were they going to stay in the Union? Were they going to go to the Confederacy? Oh, were they going to do nothing? They, they, they were all jockeying. Were they going to join gonna Canada? Do. Oh, that, that's what exactly <laughs> they were going to do. Um, exactly. Now, one state that was in the heart of all this that was surprisingly would later be synonymous with the Confederacy was, of course, the state of Virginia. Now, we're going to do a separate episode on what would become West Virginia down the road. We're going to, we're going to talk a lot about that, how it was created, um, how it became the 35th state. But we're not going to get into it too, too much right now. If you are interested, Mary, in The Moon Should Strike You, the best book by far on West Virginia is by Eric Wittenberg. He has a book called Seceding from Secession. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, it's the, it's the gold standard. So check that out. But we are going to talk about the formation of the state. 
So April 17th, 1861, the state of Virginia is going to vote to secede from the Union after the guy with the hat, Abraham Lincoln, is going to pick up the phone and call 75,000 volunteers. <laughs> And it's going to call, you know, put down the rebellion in South Carolina after the firing of Fort Sumter at 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861. Now, of the 49 delegates from north, the northwestern corner of Virginia, only 17 voted to secede. One secession did pass. A meeting was going to be held in Clarksburg, Virginia, and they were going to send delegates to Wheeling, Virginia, for a convention that was going to ultimately be held on May 13th, 1861. Some delegates, notably pro-union slaveholder guy named John Carlisle, he preferred that they form their own state and secede from the state of Virginia. Now, it led to a second convention in Wheeling on June 17th, at June, on June 11th rather, where it was agreed at the, at the overall meeting that secession by Virginia was actually um, wasn't with popular consent Therefore, it was was not legal. That's how they saw it. Wow. So on June 19th now, the convention is going to elect themselves a new governor for Western Virginia, a guy named Francis Pierpont. Now, Lincoln, of course, is going to say, yep, he's my guy. I, I totally recognize him yep. right, right off the bat. And so what they did is they gave the state or the, the area of Western Virginia two senators right off the bat. By the end of 18, by June of 1861, there are two governments operating in Virginia, a Confederate one, which we know on, you know, based out of Richmond, and a pro-union one that is based on the western area of, of Virginia. Um, due to its pro-union sentiments and proximity to Ohio, the governor of Ohio at the time, if, at the future postmaster general uh, for Lincoln later in the war, a guy named William Dennison, mm. he encouraged the new commander of the Department of the Ohio, a guy named George McClellan, Mary, perhaps you've heard of him. Yes. To lead an offensive into Western Virginia to protect the region from the rebels who wanted to prevent that region mm -hmm. from this in the state from from basically seceding from Virginia. They so they wanted to protect their interests. Now, this is going to lead to a handful of skirmishes and battles in the summer of 1861. The rebels are going to launch attacks uh, to reclaim the Kanawha Valley, which is what the, the Union had controlled really since July of 1861. Yeah. This is going to leave the battles that okay, we're not going to talk in detail. This is what we have battles like Rich Mountain, yeah. Corrix Ford, uh, Scary Creek. Great name for battle. Wow. Should have been on Halloween, by the Considering way. Considering we're saying. coming into scary season. And wasn't Rich <laughs> Mountain was um, it was a victory for McClellan, was it not? Right. Yeah, we're going to talk about McClellan here in a little bit, but this is this is this is prime McClellan. This is where he's making a name. Mm -hmm. But places like Kessler's Cross Lanes in Car uh, Carnifax Ferry, all these little battles were all fought in the summer of 1861 to drive the Confederates out of the area and protect the Western part of Virginia in the name of the Union. Now, again, we're gonna talk about this episodes in a future battle, because there's a lot of cruel episodes, and I mean, a lot of cruel battles that take place in this area, but we don't wanna go all night with this, you know, like yeah. Lionel Richie go all night long, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, exactly. So, that, but this is the situation in the summer of 1861 in the Western area of Virginia. Now, back East, Back in uh, you know this this neck of the woods sort of, the Union is also trying to protect Washington since Virginia was literally right across the river, Mary. Yeah, I don't know if you know the geography, how close they were. I'm aware. No, okay. Now, the day after uh, Virginia ratified its session, which is May 24th, it's um, around two o'clock in the morning. Union troops under Colonel Daniel Butterfield. How about how about that, Daniel Butterfield? Yeah, I'm not going to sing that song for you. No, <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> Butterfield, Butterfield, Butterfield. Point. Okay, I'm glad you I wish you did. But he's prepared to cross the Long Bridge into Arlington Heights and seize that high ground at the Arlington House, which is owned by, by former United States Colonel Robert E. Lee and his wife, Mary. Now, Ar Arlington House, which is known today as the Lee Custis House, was built on the orders of George Washington Park Custis. He's the, uh, the step-grandson of George Washington, Mary, and the grandson uh, of Martha Washington. So... The house became the home of Aunt Mary Ann Rudolph Custis, who was the daughter of George Washington Park Custis mm -hmm. and her husband, Robert E. Lee. So the Union is going to quickly set up a camp on the site, and most of the Union troops knew the significance of, of George Washington, the symbolism of, of holding this ground. One New York soldier, he joked uh, in a letter home. There is an orchard here that may have grown upon the identical apple tree that little George cut down. 
I shall send you a twig. So this is kind of what they were doing. They're having yeah. fun with it. But um, as much as, as they were having fun with it in the north, in the south, losing this ground was blasphemy. Yeah. It just didn't sit well. You know, Mary Custis wrote a letter uh, to General George Stan, George Sanford. He's the guy who ultimately took over after Lee turned it down. And he said, um, and Mary, Mary said, it never occurred to be General Stan Sanford that I may have to sue to enter my own home. Okay. And there's a reason why I'm telling you all this. This is, mm-hmm. this is going somewhere, I promise. Okay. Robert E. Lee, he accepted the loss of his home and the property, which drew a lot of pissed off people from the South about this. Lee was the new commander of, of Virginia, all armies and the Navy for that matter. Mm-hmm. And it him giving up Arlington House pissed them off greatly. South Carolina's governor, a fun lover named Francis W. Pickens married, mm-hmm. an outspoken Lee hater for through his ent- through the entire war. Yep. He said uh, when Arlington fell, Lee should have immediately blown up the bridge from Washington and fortified his wife's property. Nobody says it's his wife's property. Savage. Wow. That's okay. like taking a, a low blow right. there. I was just thinking it's so interesting how like Lee is hated, you know, by a few people in the South, probably throughout the entire Civil War, just as I'm sure the same way that Grant was as well. I just I just thought of that and wanted to put that out there for was, people to like but, to think about. You know, but 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 Pickens, um, he goes on though. He writes this letter, he continues. He says, if Lee had been the man of rep- his his reputation makes him. He never would have allowed them to cross the long bridge without a fight. Lee is not with us at heart, nor is he a common man with good he's a common man with good looks that is too cautious for a practical revolution. Wow. So the, so this this Arlington house became a hot button in the north and the south, and basically because of the symbolism of George Washington. That's what it was. Um so they they were pissed off at Lee. June 8th, 1861. Pickens is going to get his wish. Guess what's going to happen? Old Bobby Lee, he's going to lose his army over this. Yeah. And what's what, what's going to happen is he's going to keep his title, but his army is now going to fall under the jurisdiction of the Confederate States of America, no longer Virginia. Mm-hmm. So that's what's going to happen. So Lee, for the most part, he's going to end up being tied to a desk yeah. where his job is basically deal paper shuffling, dealing with personnel issues. Um, helping the side where to place batteries on rivers. Yeah, he's kind of like this advisor role, I think, to to Jefferson Davis, which I think Davis had one of those like throughout the war. That one of the last ones was Braxton Bragg. Was it not kind of a general who would yeah, advise him? But, but he, 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 it's interesting because Lee, I mean, Lee wants to be in the field more than mm-hmm. anything. That's what he wants. He, I mean, he doesn't want to be an officer with a fake title, which is how he saw it. But you know what? He did work hard at his job, but he was miserable in adding insult to injury. Uh, to injury. There were some rising stars in the Confederacy for Virginia who replaced him. Mm-hmm. One was be- uh, Pierre Gustave Tuton Beauregard was yes. one. Yeah, he was and not, Lee was not happy about that because no. the and, two of them the other one, like each other. Yeah, and the other was Joseph E. Johnson. Yep. And they, they became rock stars right, right at this point while Lee was kind of, was kind of chained to a desk. While in this position, while he's sitting at this desk, Lee is going to hire himself a new staffer, a young kid, 24 years old from VMI named Walter Taylor. And he's going to famously be on Lee's side for the rest of the war. But this is how he meets Taylor. He ends up about hiring him. Gettysburg Taylor people said, will, be a, uh, will be familiar with Taylor. Exactly. And Taylor wrote of Lee's role. He said, Lee was early at the office, punctual to all meetings, and methodical in a way of his dispatching business. So he was he was a great office temp, is what he was. Yeah. You know, that that's what he was. He was the person Lee that shows actually, up on time to work, like, or not on time, but he's like there 15 minutes early. And when everybody else comes in at like, you know, like two minutes to, it makes you look bad. I mean, he's working hard. He wants to do the best job he can, yeah. but he's miserable. Basically, he's Dwight Schrute. It's kind of who what he yeah. is it, it, from the office. That That's kind of the thing. Lee actually considers retiring and going into public, into private life. But he feels guilty of leaving the state behind. He's going to write home to Mary again, his wife, about the situation. He says, where shall I go? I don't know, as that role will depend on President Davis. Uh, so he's going to basically stick around to be his advisor, but he wants to get in the field mm-hmm. badly. And this issue of Arlington House continued. It remained on June 12th. Beauregard proposed a specific plan to attack and take the Arlington House again. He did. 
And Davis said, nope, don't yeah. want to do it. He says he's Davis basically said it was a fruitless as a position. If acquired, it would be brief. But the reason I'm saying this is because that issue was a big deal early oh, in the war. Yeah, the, sim- the symbolism of it, right? And I mean, you know, it, we're not talking about Beauregard, but that was like not the first one of his plans to get kind of sidelined by Davis. Um, but yeah, right. like like losing Arlington House is you just you have to think of it as the symbolism behind it. It's not necessarily, you know, what the thing or how big it is, whatever, but it's just what that means for losing that, right? Yeah, exactly. And he's while he's sitting around, he's formulating plans. One of the plans he comes up with, he's going to give to Beauregard. And the plan is of combining his army, this is Beauregard's army, yeah. with Joseph E. Johnson and, and, and um, concentrating in the town of Manassas, Virginia. He thinks that's probably a good idea. Mm-hmm. Davis approves this plan because he, he figures, well, if we concentrate Manassas, not far mm-hmm. from D.C., Their new commander, Irvin McDowell, he's going to have to advance and hit us. He's going to have to. So they said, you know, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. And Lee is rubbing his hands together saying, here's my chance. I'm going in the field. And guess what happens? Nope. No. He doesn't. Lee had hoped this opportunity was going to create one for himself that he was going to get out there and fight. But he was disappointed when he stayed at the desk while Beauregard and Johnson would go on to fight that successful first battle of Manassas on July 21st, 1861. Mm -hmm. And again, these two were rock stars and Lee's in the back again. He's still, he's still at that desk. Yeah. And it's a little bit, it's not necessarily, you know, it's the fact he wants to do something, but it's also a little bit personal, especially against Beauregard because the two of them did not like each other at all. No. And, but now Lee, Lee's getting aggravated now and Lee's going to get, he writes, he writes to Mary all the time. He writes again. He, this is where he wrote after the battle of first Manassas. I wished to partake in the former struggle and am mortified in my, in my absence, but the president thought it was more important that I should be here in Richmond. And you could just smell the frustration and the sarcasm mm-hmm. basically saying, you know, he thinks I'm better here. So I'm just going to stay, whatever. This is yeah. what it is. So he's getting frustrated. He's getting aggravated. Meanwhile, on the other side of the state, in, in West Virginia, Western Virginia, these battles I mentioned are continuing in the mountains and over that control and McClellan's success really coming off of First Manassas. Yeah. It, 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 op- it created an opportunity for him to come out east yeah. and let after, after what everything went down after McDowell, that fiasco Manassas. And McClellan, we talked a lot about him. He's a 34-year-old West Pointer who yep. prayed at the altar of military teachers of Dennis Mahan, yep. of uh, Antoine uh, Henri Jomini, those guys. And he was nicknamed the Young Napoleon. So he was the new commander now of the Army of the Potomac in the East. Yep. And that now, leaves in, the, in Western Virginia, or what will become West Virginia, that leaves another guy that we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast. We've done an episode about him. That leaves uh, General William Stark Rosecrans. He is here as well. So it's interesting how these figures are all kind of in what we would consider the East um, Uh at this time that they're going to go on and do, you know, Rosecrans goes on to do Tullahoma. Chickamauga is not his best day. But, you know, Rosecrans kind of is, he's on, on the Union side of it, Rosecrans and McClellan, are two rising stars as well. And now Rosecrans yeah. has command of this uh, department of Ohio. Right. So now Ro- but Rosecrans is going to be coming into Western Virginia. Yeah. McClellan's coming east. Beauregard, he, Beauregard's going to get shipped west because he pissed Davis off. Oh, yeah. He, 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 he like was like arguing against... He was arguing well, with Davis he, he, and all that other stuff. Well, he 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 actually released some... He, he basically told somebody that... If Davis let us chase down McDowell, this war would be over. Yeah. And he, he leaked something, and Davis said, the hell with you, you're going west. So he's going to basically change things himself. So McClellan is coming east. Rosecrans is taking over West Virginia. Mm-hmm. You've got Joseph E. Johnson now in the east. But, but Davis knows there's an issue in western Virginia, and he needs somebody. And he looks around and says, ah, okay, fine, Lee, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you an opportunity. How would you like to go to Western Virginia and try to settle that situation? Mm-hmm. And Lee, he, you kidding me? He was ready to go. He was yeah. all excited. Davis says to, to Robert E. Lee that basically go out to West, Western Virginia, try to help salvage that area, maybe try to reclaim some of that territory for the Confederacy. And Davis figured, well, even if Lee can't really reclaim territory, 
at least he could help at least stop or slow the Union from penetrating yeah. the mountains into the Shenandoah Valley. So it was a marriage of convenience. He's like, well, I got this guy. I might as well use him. Yeah. And Lee, though, here's the thing. And this tells you a lot about Davis's mindset. Lee was not placed in command. He no. was put in an advisory role. Yeah, he was basically going out there. And the name you know, of the to, army out there is um, called the Army of the Northwest, and we're going to get to right. this, but it's commanded by a guy named General William W. Loring. Right. William Loring is the commander in that area. So Lee is going out there for the most part to supervise. He's not going to take over. He's going to basically supervise. And we'll talk about how Loring feels about that here in a little while. Yeah. Actually, do you know but, Loring's got an interesting history with um, running away to Texas at the age of 17 after finding out about the Alamo? And his dad, like has to go haul his ass back home and he fights in like the Seminole Wars um, and all that and he practices law and he's based out of like St. Augustine, Florida because he's born in Wilmington, North Carolina. His dad is actually from Massachusetts um, and could trace his ancestry back to the, the Plymouth colony but his mother Hannah was from like, you know, prominent North Carolina family and all that. But, you know, this guy runs away to Texas at 17 because he finds out what's going on with the Alamo and he's like, he wants to fight. Um, he's in the Florida House of Representatives for a while, um, but he's he's not one of these like West Point guys, you know, so he's one of these, you know, he's just kind of joined the military um, mm. for whatever reason, but he's like 14 was the age he started fighting in the Seminole Wars. Yeah, then he found out there was no base in the Alamo and he had to come back. It yeah. happens. Oh, it God. happens, right? So on Ju so July 29th, 1861, Robert E. Lee, is gonna, is, he's going to have his two staffers, Walter Taylor... He's, he's with Taylor and a guy named John Augustine Washington III. He's going to have two black servants, a guy named Meredith and a guy named Perry with him as well. Mm -hmm. But they're going to leave Stanton, Virginia uh, for a town of Monterey, Virginia, which is about 40 miles away. And they're going to go – this is going towards the southwest. They're going to meet with the general in charge of that area named Brigadier General Henry Jackson. Jackson was a Yale grad, Thurston Howell. He was a Yale, yep. okay? But he was also a poet. Which is kind of interesting how he was, oh, just whatever. So like um, Lytle. Kind of. That's how he was. Now John John Augustine Washington the third, he was known as Augustine. He was famous. He was famous because why? He was the great grand nephew mm -hmm. of George Washington. Yep. He was the last living heir to Mount Vernon. Now you know, speaking to him real quick, you know, before the war, the thing about him, he was kind of a wild child. Growing, growing up. Before the war, he struggled to maintain Mount Vernon financially. He just couldn't handle it. Uh, he, he caught a lot of crap in Virginia when he started selling souvenirs to raise money for the place. He was cutting down trees and selling witness wood and canes made of Mount Vernon. Oh wood. my God, that's and, so hilarious because Mount Vernon probably has a yeah, souvenir shop now. It probably does. <laughs> the other thing he did that pissed a lot of people off is he had slaves. Mm. And the people... In the north, remember that George Washington freed his slaves. Yeah. Now his heir is bringing more slaves back. So he That's was he, August, Augustine was not a, was not a fan favorite to say the least. Eventually, Augustine, what he's going to have to do, he's going to have to sell Mount Vernon to a woman named Ann Pamela Cunningham, who worked for a company called the Ladies of America for a cool two hundred grand. He sold Mount wow. Vernon to her for. That must have and been quite so, a bit back then, though. It was. This is in eighteen fifty eight. He, he sold the seven slaves that were working on the site. You know what he did? He used the money to buy eight more for another property. That's what he did. In a place called Waveland. He oh had a second Oh, my God. Home. Well, obviously, he had a second home, right? It's terrible. And so, but, it, but here's the thing, though. He kind of lived a wild life. Now, in 1860, his life is going to change when his wife, Eleanor Love Selden, is going to unexpectedly die. She's going to choke to death. Uh, someone's going to find her, her face is going to be totally purple. She's going to be dead. She choked. I don't know what happened, but she, oh. she didn't make it. He decided, Augustine, that he needed to change his ways. So he decided he needed, to, he needed something, a cause to rally around. Cue the Civil War starts. Augustine saw this as an opportunity here to, to sign up, and he said of it, um, the Yankees are a set of plundering fellows who will steal in bully. We shall drive them back whipped and disgraced to their own country. Now, I'm not sure if he's talking about the baseball team or the, you know, the Northerners at this point, but mm -hmm. he was fired up and he wanted to fight. He wanted to fight the Yankees. So <laughs> he signs himself up now. Now, Lee knows Augustine because of his wife's family. 
And Lee says, well, I don't think you're a fighting type. I want to bring you on as one of my aides. So this is what, is what he does, probably to protect him realistically. Now, it's, this, is, this is where history is really cool, okay? It's ironic because Lee, you know, Lee had a descendant that basically was on George Washington's staff. 80 years earlier, his father, Larry, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee, yeah. was, in, was on George Washington's staff. 80 years later, Washington's descendants on Lee's staff. So it's exactly turned around. It's just, it's just kind of interesting thing too. I think Light Horse Larry, Her, or Light Horse Harry Lee, whatever his name, what his name was, he was a bit of a wild child as well, which is interesting to note considering that Augustine is the same way, right? Light Horse Harry Lee was a psychotic. Yes. He was. A, he was yes. He cut people's heads off. He was. He was a tough. Yeah. Dude. He was. He was like, yeah. But Augustine was um, was a little different. But it's just always kind of funny that they, they, that kind of happened. So. Lee and Taylor in Washington, along with those two servants, are going to ride on horseback down those narrow paths and rocky hills leading towards Western Virginia, where it was raining and raining and raining. Shocker. It just never stopped raining. It seems like it's always raining in the Civil War. It is, but this one's special, though. This, this one is, is really, really something. Of the weather, Lee's going to write to his wife, I've become so used to being wet and damp, I hardly think of drying anymore. That so sounds like something soaked. you would write to me, actually. Oh, God, you want to complain about it. sucks wet. Right. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Lee's been here before, though. He's been in this area before. In 1840, he's, he, he was in this area. In that same letter to Mary, he writes, If anyone told me that the next time I traveled on this road, it'd be in this present errand, I should have supposed them insane. Because now he's back years later fighting against the, the U.S. Yeah. And he, he, it's just the irony struck him. Mm -hmm. Lee's going to get to Monterey to meet with that General Harry, um, Henry Jackson. And he quickly looked around and surveyed the situation. What did he notice about Jackson's army? Is they were miserable. Yeah. They were wet. And the, the bigger issue was they were sick. There was the measles that was running through the camp like, like no tomorrow. The measles suck. I had them when I was a kid. They're terrible. Okay. Now it <laughs> rained. Exactly. It rained again every day since July 22nd. It's been raining. Morale among the men was really, really low. The officers were miserable. They, it just sighed. It just, it just stuck with like being a Guardians fan. You just, there's just no hope, <gasps> right? Now, Lee was, like I mentioned, Lee was there to advise. He was not there to take over. And, but he knew couple things. He knew the Federals had higher numbers, and he knew that they were positioned on high ground, because mm -hmm. he could tell us as he came yeah. in. And he knew that he, basically for the most part, when he when he moved, Lee would have to, would, he'd have to meet with these, these defeated Confederates. Everywhere he went, they were just sullen, they were down along the turnpike as they were going, as they were heading into the mountains. Now, as he approached these mountains, Looming in the distance is a gigantic mountain called Cheat Mountain yeah. in the Allegheny Mountains. Cheat Mountain is a monster. It's 50 miles long. It's five miles wide. And the top elevation is 4,848 feet. Wow. It's a, it's a big it's a big elevation, that's a, right? That's bigger than Lookout Mountain, I think. Almost as tall as you. Yeah, I'm tall. No, yeah, big time. <laughs> But Lee, Lee did know that any success fighting this Union army there meant they were going to have to control the roads and the passages mm -hmm. that wound around the mountain. He, he, I mean, he knew, right? So the Federals had controlled this area since McClellan had been there, and they spent considerable time kind of familiarizing themselves. Yeah, with they the knew terrain. they knew the area because they'd been out scouting around to look at it. So they knew they they knew it so well, even though it's very difficult terrain. Like anybody who's been mountain region like that is shit to try and like fight in and you've got to know your way around right and they really was probably nothing else to do they just sat around they just this reconnoitered the area well they were probably doing some whittling probably maybe, maybe a little twister but there was not a heck of a lot going on but they so but they, they used that time to really familiarize themselves with the terrain and the, and the lay of the land now the thing about it though lee did learn that there was a road that ran behind sheet mountain which looked promising, and it ran to a place called Huntersville, where a second rebel army was gathered there, and this is where the headquarters of William Loring was. Mm -hmm. So he knew there was another Confederate army, and he knew there was a road that went behind that there might have been a possibility of doing something with. To, to the north of Huntersville, there is a high ground 
which dominated the rear of Cheat Mountain. So if they could get there, and you know, like I said before, put artillery there, they might be able to. They might be able to control yeah. the, the passes. And this is what Lee's thinking. Now, for Lee, he realized there might be an op- opportunity if he could get around that Union rear and, and attack. That was probably his best hope. And it's interesting, Lee. I mean, I think Lee at this point, he he's trying to prove himself. He doesn't have the confidence he probably thought he, he had. Yep. He's going to personally recon this area in a driving rain. He's going to go off to Huntersville, and he's going to arrive there on August 3rd, 1861. And when he got there, um, he met up with Loring. Loring had set up his headquarters there on July 30th, a couple of days, and he was just sitting around. I mean, they're just doing nothing. There's nothing else to do anyway. Loring did not know Lee was coming. This is what's fascinating. He just didn't know. Ding no, one dong. Sent, no one sent a message and then no all one, of a sudden he's no like, one. hi, I'm here to advise you. He shows up and Loring looks at Lee and goes, you've got to be freaking kidding me. Because he's he just, he just, Lee is the one who put him in that job. Yeah. So now he sees Lee coming. So this really despite, you know, having no authority to take command, you know, that's what Lee was doing. But Loring was already jealous of Lee because of his reputation. Mm-hmm. And and so he, he the last thing he wanted was to see Robert E. Lee sitting around babysitting and spying on him, reporting what he was doing. That's what he thought was happening. And according to one of Loring's staffers, he wrote, General Loring cannot suppress a feeling of jealousy of Lee being on site. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, they're all yeah. alpha dog guys, right? Yeah. I mean, that happens. We've seen it happen so much in the Civil War. Like someone shows up somewhere else and gets offended by their presence. You well, know, it's like Grant when he came east with, with Meade. Overland, right? Yeah, exa- that's exactly what it's like. And of course, I'd like to, I, I'm going to guess me knew he was coming. Lee literally had no yeah, idea. Yeah, oh, I think. had no idea he was coming. Yeah, and, and I mean, he's not going there like Grant did with Rosecrans and then fires Rosecrans. And you know how, like, when, when someone's coming over your house, you're going to clean up the place. You yeah. tell everybody, you, you tell the kids, shut up and just be good. Someone's coming. I never coming. worry about that shit. Well, well, Lee, when he shows up, Loring's army is in a pathetic state. And he was disgusted at what he saw. Oh, God. Lauren's men, they were sick. They had the measles too. The rain was running through the camp. It was all mud. People were just standing around in the mud, bitching and complaining like you do all the time when the beer runs out. What? The soldiers everywhere, they were completely sick. The measles are prevalent throughout the, throughout the entire army. And Lee also, he, he ain't stupid. He could sense the animosity with Loring. He's standing there, and Loring is kind of like glaring at him, shooting daggers, and and Lee knows. And and to Lee's credit, though, he doesn't push it. He doesn't try to do – he tries to avoid a power struggle. He basically tells him, look, here's the deal. I'm not here to do anything. I'm not – I'm only here to help supervise, to be – to help you out. I'm not here to take over. I'm not. Yeah, it's kind of like the role that, you know, flash forward to near the end of the Civil War, Beauregard is going to play in the Western theater, and he's not – really he's kind of in charge but he's in this advisor role especially with john bell hood he had had the same type of role i think kind of and they're sitting around him so august 6th now lee is going to move his he's he's going to lee wants to just get away from Lauren. give him a little bit of space he's going to move his tent north to valley mountain which is closer to cheat mountain now an interesting fact about lee was he only had one tent so him and taylor and augustine they shared a tent and they, they Did had they a, have you know, a feety pajama sleepover? They had over? a feety pajama sleepover party is what they had. <laughs> oh my God. And they all stay in the same tent. Even Augustine wrote, Lee shared with his aides not only his tent, but also his wash basin and meals. So they were all, they were all hanging wow, out. Wow, they're they all were, like they were Boy all Scout camp there. And exactly. So in despite the, the lack of wanting a power struggle, I mean, Lee... Lee and Loring disagree with what, with what they wanted to do next. Yep. Lee knew – he knew that if Loring attacked right now – look, I know you guys are sick. It's raining out. It sucks. But if we attack right now, we can probably run right through these guys. Loring says, well, here's the deal, Bobby. My guys are sick. This is an inexperienced green army. What I want to do is I want to establish a base first, and I want to supply it to the hilt. Get ready to attack and then attack. That's valid. L- Lori was preparing for a, for, for a long campaign, yeah. which, was, which was probably right, admittedly. Lee wanted a quick attack, and he knew in his mind it was – even though the guys were sick and the weather wasn't good, 
it was worth yeah. the risk. Mm. Now, so Lee has two choices at this point. Okay, he says, "Well, I can wait on Loring and try to convince him to attack, or I can be a dick and I can overrule his authority and order his troops forward anyway." Now, the problem was Lee could not bring himself to do that. No. So, what he does, he messages Loring on, on the seventh of August. He says, "Listen, why don't you bring your army to my headquarters of Valley Mountain?" And we can sit down and we can come up with the game plan. Okay, then it'll be your plan, but why don't you come? And it must have been killing Lee because he knew the feds were giving Loring a golden opportunity to strike because that back road was wide yeah. open and Loring was ignoring it. Who probably out of spite for Lee, probably, but who knows? Yeah, well, but maybe Lee's because his there. men were sick and he was like, I don't want to make my guys fight if they're sick. <laughs> so he, so Loring says, okay, I, I'll come up. I'll bring my guys to Valley Mountain. I'll be right there. Guess how long it takes for him to get to get to Lee's headquarters a couple of miles away? A uh, long time. Like probably like four it's like, days. Four oh, days. So it's like driving from one right. end of Boston to the other? Even you could roll skate backwards and make it there in four days. It's, he, he took his sweet time. He didn't arrive till the, till the 11th of August. And by then, guess what happens? The Fed said, oh, shit, that road is uncovered. We better block that. And guess what? They did. Yeah. So Lee now, he's face palming, saying, we blew this chance. If we attack, we could have gone right up that road. It was wide open. Loring was slow. The Feds discovered it. They blocked it. And now we're screwed. And I'm not going to blame Loring on, for this one because the guys were sick. Well, I mean, that that's the thing. They were sick. Now, the thing about it was, at this point, the armies the Confederate and the Union yeah. were three miles apart. Yeah. That's how close they were. They were very, very close. And the rain has now gone 20 consecutive days nonstop. Just think about that for a second. 20 freaking days. I can only expecting... imagine the messages I'm I mean, getting They're probably collecting from you. animals by two at this point, getting ready to put them on the boat. <laughs> I can only how, imagine the, the letters I would be getting from you. Oh. Yeah, that's not, I, I wouldn't do it. But that's. <laughs> but this is the environment they're in. So Lee now is he knew that on, he knew that on on top of Cheap Mountain, the army was there was going to be led by Joseph J Reynolds J J Reynolds mm -hmm. if you're nasty J J right that's what that's what he yeah. went by. Now one thing Lee did not know is how many men he had. Mm -hmm. The other thing Lee didn't know was what J what John, Johnson was what Reynolds was up to. Was he going to attack him? Was he going to attack? What we don't Nobody know. Knows. But but we're close. I know there's an army up at that top of that mountain. I have no idea how many men there are. I know they know that we're here. Yeah. And I don't know if they're going to attack and us. Does he have any idea how they're spread out? Because like Reynolds has his guys spread out where he's got, you know, Colonel Nathan Kimball up on Cheap Mountain with the remaining three regiments at the camp Elkwater near the Tigert River, which is where Reynolds has his headquarters. Like is the con are the Confederates even aware that's how he's got his guys spread out? Well, it's funny you mention that because they, Lee wonders the same thing. He gets a wondering, and he decides himself with Taylor and Augustine to go reconnoiter and go answer that question. So they go on a little expedition. They go on a little fun run to go see what the scoop is. And while they're out, a rebel patrol sees the three men, thinking they're a Union scouting party. And they chase them down and they capture them. It's the only time Robert Lee was ever caught in the Civil War. But he was lucky because it was by his own men. Oh, my God. And, he was and he's lucky he wasn't shot, too, if you think about it. Well, yeah, he might have went but, the way of Stonewall Jackson. You know, but Lee, you know, he was he was relentless on trying to find a path. And one rebel soldier said, said of Lee, he said, there was not a day when it was possible for him to be out that the general might not might not be seen might not be seen crossing the mountains, climbing over rocks to get a view of the federal position. So what's Lee doing? He's personally climbing rocks, looking around. He says, "If they're not going to do it, I'm going to do it." I mean, so Lee himself good does for, good for him. That's a lot. Like I think Sherman did some personal reconnaissance. I think it was during the Vicksburg campaign where he really put. I know there was one episode we did where we were talking about Sherman. I think it was in Vicksburg, and he like went up and nearly got himself killed at one point because he was so close to where they were supposed to be. But I mean, there's points in the civil war where, you know, the guys that would usually do that, they're like, F this, like they pull out their F this card. 
No, um, but there was, there was a few times. I mean, Lee, yeah. obviously, Lee was almost shot in the face at Manassas, second yeah. Manassas. He was almost caught at Spotsylvania. But this is the one he was out looking for love in all the wrong places. He was out there himself, putting himself out in the front line. Yeah. And But his persistence, though, he was looking. He finally paid off. Looking north from Valley Mountain, he did notice the feds were entrenched 10 miles down that Harnesville Road at a place called Elkwater you just talked about, mm-hmm. which is about seven miles west of Cheat Mountain. The federal position um, was blocked by the other rebel army that was still stuck down that Stanton turnpike. Now, with both roads blocked, Lee knew that he had to move his men through those deep woods and this undergrowth which was, again, soaked due to this freaking yeah. nonstop rain. Now, the rain will be a constant in this campaign, and Lee talked about it a lot. In all of his writings, he wrote again, it rains here all the time, literally. There has not been sunshine since my arrival enough to dry my clothes. Are you so sure he's, he's not like your spirit animal for talking oh, about the God. weather? It's, it's, I'm cold. It sucks. I'm just going to go I home. I hear about it all the time. Yeah. It's raining again. It's raining in Plymouth. Oh, my God. But, but again, he's sitting there. They're three miles away from the Union. It's pouring rain. It won't stop. The other issue that we talked about before, which is still going on, is these friggin' measles. Is the sickness? They suck. And, Have you had the measles? Um, no, maybe, maybe when I was they younger. S- they suck. Well, I had the bad measles, the, the red measles. They suck. Very the bad. other thing that was that was pissing. They didn't know a lot about hygiene or that stuff back then. But Lee was pissed off at these, at these these troops too. His frustration was getting really, really bad at how undisciplined Loring's men were. He told Mary, and he wrote, "Loring's army says was worse than children." That's what he said about the, these these soldiers. Oh my now, God, it sounds like what I deal one, with on the T on a daily there, basis. There, this funny story there was one time when Lee noticed a private getting ready to drink out of what he thought was a spring, and it was actually a latrine. And Lee said, "Don't drink out Ew. of there. That's not the water. You, Ew, you David. The, you don't want to drink the brown water. You want to drink the white water." The clear one. That's all. The, so, and he's just rolling his eyes, going, "Geez, no one of these people are sick." And, Jeez, but, that's so. Oh, it sounds like you and, know what. This whole situation reminds me a lot about what happens after Shiloh in Corinth in 1862, with uh-huh. how all the guys there, once Beauregard had them there, like they all got sick. The water was bad, and then Beauregard has to leave, and he gets, you know, obviously what happens to him with that. But it reminds me a lot of that. Like, and I wonder, you know, I think there's a lot of instances of that in the Civil War where the men are just like, they're sick. And it's probably, well, it's a whole be- it's probably because of the water. Oh, guys getting sick drinking the pond of the green water. But the, the cherry on Lee's Sunday, though, was how the Southern press were treating all this. There was no stories of battle. There was nothing. So they were making up fake stories of all these grand maneuvers that Loring and Lee were doing in the mountains, how wonderful it was. They're doing fantastic things. And Lee's reading this, and he's like, and he knows he's sitting around in the rain doing nothing. There was no battles. There was no fantastic maneuvers. And once Lee heard about this, he's like, this is, screw this. He's going to decide that tomorrow morning, you, Augustine, you're going back to Richmond, and you're going to tell Davis what the hell we're doing here. Let him know that there's no grand stuff going on here. We're sitting around literally doing nothing. We are spending time looking for the Rosewoods clown out here. That's that's our excitement out here. Oh so God. please go back and let him know this is what's going on. Okay? And then Augustine's like, okay, because he wants to fight. He's like, I guess I got to go home tomorrow. The next morning, guess what happens when he wakes up? It stopped raining and the sun came out. Wow. Lee said, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. No, he didn't really say that. Did Lee write his wife, Mary, and (laughs) tell tell her how happy he was that the rain had stopped? Oh, well, um, he really didn't, actually. (laughs) But what what he, he basically realized, the rains finally stopped, the sun is out, and more importantly, he could see Cheat Mountain much more clearly now, and now he realized this mountain looks vulnerable from two directions that I couldn't see because of all the rain. So August 31st, Lee is going to basically get news. He's going to get news that, guess what, that he was made a full general in the Confederate Army. Yeah, right. Wow. Along with Albert Sidney Johnson and Samuel Cooper, who both outrank Lee. No one's heard of yeah. Samuel Cooper, but he was a general too. I've heard of him. Also, he found that Beauregard and Joseph Johnson also got their official stars. Oh, he was like that. But Lee outranked both of them. And um, that did not treat Johnson don't like that too much at all. 
So well, Jolie, no, I wouldn't like that either if I was Johnson. Oh no, but it's okay. So now Lee basically, um, he he's he's a full general in the Confederate Army, and at this point, Lee is slowly starting to usurp power away from Loring. He's just kind of like taking an inch at a time. I'm, what do we do this? We're gonna do this. Finally, Loring says basically, you know what? Whatever, just take over. Just yeah. do it. He he acquiesces to Lee kind of taking over field command at this point. And Lee's like, all right, deal. And so he he doesn't have to worry about this. Lowering the, the tensions aren't as bad anymore. Lee is going to send out scouts hoping that, that he can find a way or up and around Cheap Mountain. And one of the scouts is going to come back. And this is going to be a guy named Colonel Albert Rust. He's yes. a colonel of the 3rd Arkansas. And according to Rust... He and a civil, a civilian engineer were riding around in the mountains, and they discovered a path that they believed led to the top of the mountain. And Rust told him not only this, he says he was 100% positive that a column could go up this path to the top of the mountain, and it comes out right on the Union's right flank. Could not, could not have been made better. And so... It would be a hard march. It's mm-hmm. going to be over a wet path. We're going to have to climb some rocks. It's going to be a brutal march, but we can. I I know we can get up there. I like how he's talking and, it up. Like we can do this. Yeah, he he wants to do it. Also, Lee's going to learn from the southwest that a second off road route uh, led right up the savanna of the mountain. Ooh. So there was another path as well. So if Rust is correct and that column could hit the Union flank while a second column that hit the back of the mountain, uh, he basically, you'd have Rust attacking, and you'd have that other column blocking the retreat on the back side of the mountain. Even, even a sick, inexperienced army could actually pull this thing off. And so things, things are looking pretty good all of a sudden, mm-hmm. right? Well, they are, yeah. They're, they're looking bright. <laughs> but Lee has been sitting around, and he realizes that the time to attack is finally here he's been thinking of this since he got the gig and he's finally has an opportunity he's itching to fight he, he's been wanting to get on the field forever and so he writes to mary um basically he says you know now to drive them further battle we must come off and i'm anxious to begin it he's 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 excited to he's do it now. To go. he is and you can only imagine now lee is going to write out this plan and he's going to he picked dawn Thursday September 12th 1861 and this is special order 27 right 27 yes. you got it special order 27 and here's what lee wanted to do okay it goes a little something like this this is what he wanted to do he says lee and loring are going to lead the remainder of the army from valley mountain north to, uh, for the attack on the union troops positioned at elkwater okay the troops going up the path to the Union flank to take Cheat Mountain could then advance up the Stanton Turnpike to the intersection of Huntersville, Huntersville Road to a place called to the place north of Elkwater, thus surrounding the entire army at Elkwater. Game, set, match. If he does that, it's over. That, that's it. It sounds great and on paper. And the other interesting thing to note, too, about the Special Order 27 is Rust is one of the ones that signs it. Because Lee wanted to increase the confidence of Rust's subordinates because Rust is, unfortunately, even though he's discovered all this shit, not very well liked. Well, the thing about Rust is right. He says, listen, General Lee, um, I found the path. I should lead the attack. Yeah. That we'll, we'll talk about Rust here in a few minutes, but, but that's in a nutshell what he does. And Lee's plan, though, this is a simultaneous attack with inexperienced men it's heavily based on logistics and timing. They had the two separate columns. They had to work simultaneously despite the weather. It's still muddy and crappy yeah. in the brutal terrain they had to get through. So like we said before, Lee's, Lee is going to need that commander to lead that men up the path to Cheat Mountain. And the guy they found, they found the path, like I just said, Albert Russ, he's the commander of the 3rd Arkansas. He's from Henry Jackson's brigade, mm-hmm. the poet's. He, he, again, he approached, he's begging, please, please, please let me lead this thing. For whatever reason, Lee acquiesces to this. Yeah, and, and Rust is the one that is going to have to, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, he is the one that is going to have to initiate the battle. Right, because his, when the, the what's going to happen is once 
they hear the guns of Albert Russ going. That's the that's the starting that's the gun signal. to start the other half of the attack. Yeah. So the sound of the attack would be literally the starting gun to attack the whole thing. Now here's what the thing about Albert Rust, okay? He's kind of a lunatic. He's yeah. not a West Pointer. He's a congressman from the second Arkansas district who famously beat up al uh, abolitionist in New York uh, Tribune newspaper uh, Horace Gracely Horace really? Greeley with his cane one time. So he beats the hell out of Greeley with his cane. A week later, he's walking down the street. He sees Greeley. You know what he does? Beats him up he again. Beats him up again. Except this this time, this is in Washington. This time he gets arrested. Okay. They bring in Russ for beating up Horace Greeley a sec. First time was a pass. Okay, shit happens. Second time, nope, now you gotta go. They bring him in, right? Now I know why they Horace bring... Greeley and Gangs in New York looks look like such a badass. <laughs> So, so they bring him in, a Washington journalist, a famous writer, his name was Benjamin Poor. He wrote of Rust at this arraignment, right, because he was there. He said, Rust appeared to be in his glory of what he had done. So he was at the arraignment going, yep, I did it. It was fun. This it was is effed up. Like, what the? You know? Oh, my God. But he, anyway, he, he gets off, whatever happens. But that's the end of that. But that's, 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 that's Rust. When the war began, he basically joined the 3rd Arkansas as a colonel despite having zero um, military backgrounds to speak of whatsoever. And for with all this, the Horace Greeley stuff, the no military background, a very little experience in the third Arkansas, Lee felt Rust was the guy to command 1,500 men to hit the Union flank and be the most important part yeah. of the attack. This is the guy he picks. Now we talked about, you know, we talked about the crater. We talked I was just Burnside, thinking right? that with Burnside and his short straws, like. Right. I mean, this one, this one might be just as bad. I, I honestly think it is, just because of, and we'll talk about this because of what happens. But yeah, I was thinking when when I was researching this episode, I'm like. This is kind of like short straws, but I mean, he's not drawing the short straws. He's basically doing, he's basically like, this guy is going to do it. I mean, you, you had some people. You had Alexander Tolliver was there. Uh, you had George Maney. Talifero. Talifero. And the guy they pick is, is Rust. But for whatever reason, he's, he's going to pick Rust. And so the other part of the attack was going to be led by a guy named General Samuel R. Anderson, his Tennesseans. And they're going to move right down the western ridge of Cheat Mountain until they reach that road that led to the summit behind that Tigers Valley you talked about and occupy the valley and block roads. So all the pieces are coming into place, right? Mm. The night before the battle, on September 11th, Lee is going to give his men one of those Robert E. Lee speeches. He's going to fire his men up. He's going to say... Like in Gettysburg? He's going to say, he's going to say gentlemen, the eyes of the country are upon you. The safety of your homes and lives... Of all, all you hold dear depends on your courage and your exertions. That's that's what Lee says. That's what he wrote. That he says. That's what that's what Saltall Freeman said. He says, "Who the hell knows?" But that, yeah. that's what it, what it says in his book. One guy who got fired up about these words was guess who? Augustine Washington. Yeah. Because he he because don't forget he was one day away from getting sent home, and the sun saved his opportunity. Yeah. He'll find out later. He probably wishes it rained, but he sees this as his chance to fight. In the weeks leading up to this, when they were sitting around in the rain doing nothing, August Augustine, who had lived that wild lifestyle, he kind of discovered the Bible. Mm. He was he was reading the Bible. He was he was leading uh, Bible classes. Oh, so he's like um, Howard. He was doing sermons, kind of. Oh he, my he, God, he, I got, got my reference in. You know, he he got very <laughs> pious. He lost thirty pounds of weight, which he described as superfluous beef. That's what he called it. I'll have to like great tell myself that next time I'm way. working out. I'm losing some superfluous. That's what he. Beef. That's what that's what he called losing thirty pounds. Superfluous beef. Anyway, so Augustine was not afraid to die because he's been reading the Bible. He says the whole matter is in God's plan. That's that's how it was. This is wow. a very different Augustine Washington. He was one hundred percent in Lee's service at this point, in the same way that uh, Light Horse Harry Lee was in Washington's service. Yeah, uh, completely in his service. Mm. So. Late on the night of September 11th, the rain, guess what? It's going to start again. Because, of course, it's going to Shock. rain again. And Lee is sick of waiting. He's like, you know what? Hell or high water. See what I did there? We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And says, we're, we're, we're going. We're going. I don't care if it's going to rain. YOLO. So, yeah, pr pretty much. Now, Lee said he, you know, he felt good about the prospects and despite the rain – and the, the men had to sleep standing up the night before because they couldn't sleep with the water was so high in the puddles. 
but Lee that's still that's a felt hard pass right there. But the the thing you got to give Lee credit for though was he got those men in position where they were supposed to be. He yeah. got them to the launching point, which you, which he doesn't get. No, look, I realize no one studies cheat mount, but if you study cheat mounts and you realize how what a good feat that was to get these troops sick, inexperienced in the rain to their launching positions mm -hmm. and, and actually get there. And he actually did. So he gets them there and the next morning came, it was going to start at dawn on the 12th. So he's waiting on rust. Rust goes up, goes up with his 1500 guys up at the top of the mountain. And he knows when he hears those first shot, that, yeah. that sound of chopping wood in the distance, the musket fire, that it was going to be the time for the signal gun to go for the other men to assault elk water. Yeah. So all the troops are in position. They're ready to go in the early dawn. The rain did finally slow down early in the dawn. So the sky did clear a little bit when the sun came up. So things were going to feel a little bit better themselves. Lee could see the Union camp at Elkwater, and he saw, how again, how vulnerable they were. He wrote, I could see the enemy, tents on the Valley River at the point on the Huntersville Road just below me. We waited on the attack on Cheat Mountain, which, is, which was to be the signal. That's what he said afterwards. Mm -hmm. So he's sitting there waiting, and the morning ran on, and the men were anxious because they were just yeah. waiting for that fire because they knew they were going to go. And this is the first battle for a lot of these guys, too. Mm -hmm. The sun began to rise higher in the sky, and the silence from Cheap Mountain became deafening. Yep. There was nothing, right? There's nothing going on. Nothing going on. 8 o'clock in the morning now. Still nothing from rust on the mountain. Finally, Lee hears musket fire, pop, 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 and he's like, okay, that is. But then he's like, wait a second. It's coming from the other direction. Mm -hmm. what the, who the hell is that? You know, um, so he he, re he realizes it's coming from the other direction from where General Anderson's Tennesseans were at a place called Becky Run. Mm -hmm. And Anderson reported that they had attacked some federal pickets. And Lee's like, well... I wish you didn't do that because that kind of gives away all of our surprise. Yeah. Didn't didn't want you to do that. We were waiting on Rust. You weren't supposed to attack. And they were like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. So basically what happens is um, Lee is going to ride out at this point to, to go deal with what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. And he finds himself riding right into the federal lines by doing this. And he was right. He was within rifle shot. He was. And if they saw him, he easily could have been gunned down, but he got yep. in and out of there. And then he found out later on through Anderson what happened. But by the time he reached, he comes back to his camp. It's about, it's about 10, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning at this point. And he started to get concerned about rust. And the reality is the plan he had was pretty much that he'd been preparing for for weeks and yep. had everything figured out was basically shit canned at this point. Yep. He, he knew that he needed another plan at this point. It wasn't going to happen. It... And, you know, like, this is where, like, you know, so they're waiting and, you know, the one thing going against Rust is, you know, there is the weather at first, there's the geography, they don't know the area, um, the three, the, the brigades that have been assigned to attack the Cheat Summit Fort, um, all act, they end up acting independently of each other because, and they never make contact. So there's no contact between where any of them are. So each brigade is going blindly into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can see how, in hindsight, how it was all going to fall apart. So yep. Lee is trying to keep his men fired. He's riding regiment to regiment, saying, we can still do yep. it, boys. We can still do it. And the officers are rolling their eyes. Because don't forget, Lee is, he's not, this is not Chancellorsville Robert e. Lee here. No. This is, this is Robert e. Lee who lost Arlington House, who was yep. only here because, because they needed someone else. Yeah, they need, so this they, is not, I mean, Lee has to become the Lee he's going to be at Chancellorsville. He's still, yeah. you know, almost like two years away from that. Well, he's like, he's like the, you know, the boy who cry wolf. He's like, any minute we're going to attack. Just yeah. listen, any minute. And then it never happens. They're all like, okay, well, don't worry. It's going to happen. They're all yeah. like, yeah, it's going to happen. Sure thing. So finally by noon, Lee realized that the opportunity was lost. This whole, he lost the element of surprise because the Anderson guys fired on the federal pickets. And he knew that his first experience as field commander had fizzled. Yeah. So he knew that was pretty much lost, but he, he always was wondering what the hell happened to Albert Rust. So throughout the remainder of the afternoon, yeah. and on the evening of the 12th, Lee decides, well, I don't know what the hell happened to him, but I need to figure out another plan. So I'm going to sit down, think of something else. So 
the next morning, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to do something. So now heading into the 13th now, he thought that maybe west of the mountain, there could be a place to turn the federal, other, other federal flag. Yeah. But he didn't know. He's like, well, I, I got to re, I need to send out a scouting party to go recon this and see if there's, if there's a way, this side's not working. Let me try the other side. Maybe I'll get lucky. So Lee turns around and standing right there is Augustine Washington. Mm -hmm. And he says, listen, here's, here's what I want you to do. Take these orders, go find the nearest, the first cavalry guy you find, give him these orders and, um, and, and to go recon. So he yep. does, he, the guy he runs into is who? Lee's son, Rooney Lee. Yeah. That's who he runs into. 24 year old Rooney is the first guy he sees. So Rooney is impulsive as hell. I mean, he just the last guy you probably do. He's, he's a bull in a china cabinet, right? Isn't Rooney involved he, in the shad bake at the end of the civil war? Well, he's, he's, a, he, he, his entire, his career throughout the day is he's, he's, a, he's impulsive. He's reactionary. He's, he's, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. That's how he is. So he happily accepts the order to recon this union position over near Elkwater. He's going to do it. So um, again, Washington has been ready to fight and he's like, yep. can I please come? Please, 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 please. And so um, Lee's like, oh, God, okay, you know what? Fine. Just, just go. Just um, what's the worst that could possibly happen? Just, just go figure it out. Go come back. So, um, so Rooney, He's going to write of Washington's attitude before heading off to this little mission. He's going to write, notwithstanding, Colonel Washington seemed to enjoy it and frequently expressed himself with delight. That's what he said. Washington was all excited to be riding with Mooney. Well, he's just looking for something to do at this point, right? He was. So they're riding along. He's kind of like Alexander get... Hamilton was, you know, yeah, kind of, when kind he of. was Washington, because ha Hamilton was one of Washington's aides as well. And he was always like, I want to fight. I want to fight. I want to do something. Yeah. Well, they they ride off and they, they get to a point, they get to a ravine and they look and they see that maybe there's an area here where he's like, okay, I think this is far enough. Let's go back and tell General Lee that we may have found something. We'll go back. So at that very moment, Washington looks down the hill and he sees a single Union officer sitting on a gray horse all by himself, just sitting there. And Rooney, they're looking at him and, and Washington is all excited. Washington yells, let, let us ride and capture that fellow on the gray horse, right? Yeah. Why would and so you Rooney is like, is like, um, yeah, whatever. So let's, let's, go, let's go chase him now. Let's go get him. So they rush full speed on their horses down the hill to go get this guy. On this horse with a single guy. As they approach him, from the underbrush comes a volley of bullets. They rode into an ambush. Mm -hmm. This was a setup to catch them. And and they rode, Rooney and Washington rode right into it. Rooney wasn't shot. He was thrown off of his horse. Mm -hmm. Augustine was shot three times in the ass. Three times. That's where it got him. Oh, okay. God. He, fell off, he fell off his horse. Rooney. Now, this With is the this same is way as Kearney. Exactly. Rooney's down. He's got shot. You know, there's better days behind him now, if you want to mean. He's <laughs> shot on the ground. Rooney's on the ground. He gets up. He jumps on Ro He jumps on Augustine's horse and rides away and leaves him. See ya. Wow. He, even, he leaves him behind and takes his horse and leaves and runs away and takes off. And so the Federals see this guy and they're trying, who are you? Who are you? And, and uh, Augustine was dying. All he could, all he could say was enough to beg for water, and then he died. Wow! So he died in front of them, and they're all they're, the Federals are standing around going, "Well, I don't know who this this guy is." But that they're um, with the, you know, the great grand nephew of they, the they founder no of their country. So they what what do they do? They start rummaging his pockets, and they got steal oh, all his stuff. They go through his pockets, and they find I don't know, they found his Virginia driver's license. They found they found <laughs> his identification. And they realized who it was. And those guys realized they killed the great grand nephew of George Washington in the last living heir to Mount Vernon. And they're all like, holy crap. They found two revolvers. And the guy who they decided killed him, they gave one of the revolvers wow. to as a souvenir. You know what happened to the other revolver? That it was Vernon. given to Simon Cameron, the Secretary of War. Why would you give it to Cameron? It. They gave it to Simon Cameron because it was the killed George Washington's relative, right? Cameron said of this prize, he said, I shall always prize it uh, as a memorable relic of the present glorious struggle for freedom and for the Union. 
So he knew it was there was George Washington's wow. relatives. What and so he kept the he kept the gun. Just a quick question: Where now. is it now? It, like, I, does I anyone no know idea. where either of them are? No idea. It's probably been lost in history. That's going to find. That's going to be found in someone's attic someday. S- some somebody might know, but that but that's what happened with that. So what happens is Rooney, he's going to ride back. And, dad, 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 guess what? He's going to go tell Robert Lee what happens, and and so, so he says, you know, he says, "Is he dead? I mean, what the hell happened?" And he goes, I don't know. But then he yelled at Rooney for being overzealous. He just he just did. Wow. The next day, September 14th, uh, under a flag of truce, Lee's going to send a message requesting information on Colonel August, Augustine Washington. He's going to write, Lieutenant Colonel John A. Washington, my aide de camp, while riding yesterday, was fired upon by your pickets and I fear killed. Should this be the case, I request that you deliver to me his body. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, word's going to come back and say, yep, he didn't make it. He went off the spout. He died. Washington's dead. So Lee was really busted up about this. First of all, he says, you know something, Rooney? You did this. You're going to get his body. He makes Rooney get the body wow. to, to go back and get him. Now, the, the Washington's death really, really affected. I think of a lot how Baker's death affected Lincoln, right? This mm-hmm. was kind of similar because or there was Ellsworth. a long history to it. And I think he felt... I, well, right, but I think he felt that he brought on Augustine Washington on his staff to protect him from himself. Yeah, and he let he authorized this mission to let him get killed. So he he finds out that he's dead, and a soldier was nearby when Lee got the word, the confirmation. He wrote, "I saw him when he just learned of the death of Colonel Washington." Speaking of Lee, he was standing with his right arm thrown over the neck of his horse with a look of extreme sadness that pervaded his countenance. And word got back to the South that this happens. And guess what? They were pissed at Lee, okay, for killing the heir of Washington. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the guy who lost Washington's house. Now he gets his relative killed. Our newspaper in Richmond, the Richmond Examiner, which was the big paper at the time, he wrote, our enemies have stamped their attack upon our rights with additional infamy of killing the lineal descendant and representative of George Washington. The Northern Press, the Daily Cleveland Herald, Miriam, Ohio, of course, wow. they, they, took the, they took the opposite approach. They wrote, of, of speaking of Washington's death, he justly met with the traitor's deserts. That's what they wrote. And they wrote that the editor wrote, my wish is the memory of the great immortal Washington will not be insulted by laying the bones of his wretched namesake upon the po- any portion of Mount Vernon. Oh. Okay. You know where he's buried? Mount Vernon? Nope. Charlestown, West Virginia. Wow. Right around the corner from where John Brown was executed. Interesting. So I don't know if it's symbolism, a traitor thing. I don't know if that's why they did it, wow. but they buried, that's where they buried him. So if you go to Charlestown, West Virginia, you can go find the, go find the grave of John Brown. Oh, that, that's interesting what he was. So basically, once the shock of Washington's death kind of faded, Lee found out what happened to Rust. Yes, and it's it's quite an interesting story. You know, it, it's quite interesting what happened to him. So he is at, Rust is advancing when he encounters two Union pickets, so just two guys, and they just they're like, "F this, we're gonna go." They run away. He kills them, but this alerts the other pickets that are nearby, and there's some fighting that ensues. So, obviously, the advancing Confederates, Rust, had lost the element of surprise by this point. But several pickets are captured, and what they do is they falsely exaggerate the size of the Union force that is at the camp um, on Cheat Mountain. And Rust ends up believing these accounts. Now, the person that is in charge of these soldiers, the Union guy on Cheat Mountain, is um, the leader of the 14th Indiana, a guy named Colonel Nathan Kimball, who is kind of this, like... He flies under the radar when it comes to Civil War history. Nobody really studies Kimball, but he's an interesting guy. Um, So he's born in 1822 in Fredericksburg, Indiana. He's educated at, I'm going to butcher this, DePauw University from 1839 to 1841. And he's a teacher of farming in Independence, Missouri for a while after this. Um, He studies medicine at the University of Louisville in 1844. And he establishes his private practice in Salem and Livonia after this. And he's involved in the Mexican War. He does really well at the Battle of Buena Vista. 
And after the war in 1847, he returns to Indiana, where he resumes practicing medicine. He runs for the Indiana State Senate um, as a Whig in 1847. And in 1854, he joins the newly formed Republican Party. So he's very much what we consider, like, you know, he's very progressive for his time. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he volunteers again. He'd done this during, you know, in the Mexican War, he'd volunteer, raised, raised a company. He does the same thing with the Civil War. So Governor Oliver Morton names him the colonel of the um, one over 1,000 men, the 14th Indi- Indiana on July 7th, 1861. Their first combat is going to be at Cheat Mountain. And these guys, basically, what they do is they just raise all hell and they make it seem like they have more men than what they do. And yeah, that's so, what, what, so what not, does. not only do you have this recon or not the, you know, the prisoners that are captured that are like, Oh yeah, we've got this many men. We're going to beat you guys. You have Kimball and his guys able to create such a ruckus that it makes it seem like they have, you know, twice as many men is what they actually do. And it scares the hell out of Russ. I love, and he I love just that, like, sto- that story because they catch the guy and, yeah. and they said, how many guys you've got up there? They have 300. And he goes, we've got 5,000 men up there. Yep. And just so you know, just so you know, they're, they're, they know where you're coming. They dug breastworks. They're ready for it. Also, it gets even better. But wait, there's more, he says. We've also telegraphed to get more guys coming. They should be here any minute now. Yeah, and that Roscoe, part is true, oh, though. Here. They were yeah. they were sending guys from Elkwater to them. But you can imagine, like when I read that story, I was like, okay, Kimball probably told the pickets, if you're captured, tell them this. Yeah, I mean, exaggerate it, the hell out of it, you know. And that's what that's what he did. And I mean, again, you don't know what to believe, but you have fifteen hundred guys. And you think you're being told there's 5,000 more and they're entrenched and ready for you. Um, yeah, I mean, again, Rust, this is not Stonewall Jackson here in the Valley. This is a guy who this is his first real go of it. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have any military experience. He doesn't want to get his ass shot. So he's like, well, maybe we should just slowly head back and not do it. Yeah, he has That's a my he people does. need me moment. And he's like, I have to go. <laughs> they just run back. I mean, they ran back faster than the time it takes for you to shotgun a Molson Golden Cap. That's how fast they were back down the mountain. Oh, they I haven't done no that since I was this. like 17. 17, like seven. <laughs> but, you know, even even with all of this, though, Lee, with losing Washington, missing all this, he, he still kind of wanted to, he still was fired up to do something. But then he realized, well, this is a complete waste of time because he knew that there was a report that Rosecrans was advancing up the Canoa Valley yeah. in against against Henry Wise, Virginia governor we talked about, and John Floyd, though those rebel armies that he knew that they were coming in that direction. So finally he's like, well, I have no choice but to or- issue order special order GTFO and get out of here. <laughs> GTFO. And then he's going to tell Loring it's it's time to go get in the car. It's, 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 this is over. And, and so and so that kind of ends you call it the Battle of Cheat Mountain, and there it really wasn't much of a battle. No. But it, but the thing, and this is a cla- we've, we've said this a million times, but the, the big three weather communication terrain. This one was all of them. This one got them bad, yeah. and it doomed the Confederates and really spoiled Robert E. Lee's really first opportunity to yeah. command that army. And the Southern press they they needed a scapegoat, and they already down on Lee anyway, and they just they Lee was their guy. Not just for Washington's death, but also for this entire what they perceive as a bungled operation. The Richmond uh, Richmond Dispatch they wrote about it. The days Lee spent weaving ingenious webs of strategy about the about Cheat Mountain had only given the Union time to tighten its grip on the region. Legs and powder balls do much better in the mountains than the science of a Lee. So this is building up those stories I was talking about earlier in the yeah. press about how he was doing all these magical things. And they find out nothing happens. They're like, well, he spent more, maybe he spent less time strategizing and more time fighting, which is ironic because he would have if Loring had agreed at the beginning he was going to yeah. attack. October but I mean, 31st, again, I, I go back. I don't blame Loring because the guys had measles. Right. But by October 31st, Lee has, Lee's back in Richmond now. And what's funny about it, though, is, and this is interesting, was when he left for the mountains, he was clean shaven. 
when he got back, he had that big white beard that he's famous for seeing. Oh wow! And he wrote he wrote a letter to Mary warning her that next time you see him, got a beard. He he basically says he says there was little time there for shaving and personal adornment. He said to her, "I now I now have a beautiful white beard." And so he shows up in Richmond. The, they're attacking him in the media for everything he did, yeah. and they gave him the nickname Granny Lee because he's got the white beard. Wow. He's kind of dawdling. He screws up. That's where the nickname comes from. Is that's where it comes from? And he's and, what? How old is he at this point? He's like fifty-five. It's something, I'm not exactly sure how old he is, but he's he's probably, yeah, probably right around there. Yeah. But the th- the thing about Lee though was he was getting ripped apart in the media. And you know what he did? He took the blame. He did. And this was refreshing for Davis because Davis is used to Beauregard and Johnson doing the shaggy thing. It wasn't me, but, you know, pointing at Especially everybody. Beauregard. Beauregard is so, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I love Beauregard. He's such an interesting study, but he does the shaggy thing. He's like, it wasn't me yeah, <laughs> all exactly. the time. You know, the, the, the thing about Lee at Gettysburg, it is all my fault. I pray to you. Know, this, this is true. And he did it here too. Yeah. He basically said he took the blame. He said, you know, Unlike Beauregard, who blamed Davis for, for not bagging McDowell after, after Bull Run, he said, yeah, he says, um, I, it, this is all me. And it actually impressed Jefferson Davis. So Lee at this point, again, he, he really wasn't – he had no reputation to fall back on. It wasn't like Gettysburg where he screwed up or had, it didn't work out, but he mm-hmm. was still Robert E. Lee with all his, the cachet. He was a guy who easily could have been replaced and dumped pretty amazing, pretty amazingly early. But Davis liked him. But there were too many generals who were busy running their mouths in the Confederacy. Yes. And when everything went wrong, and yes. Davis took a shine to Lee for owning it. And like I mentioned before, Beauregard was shipped west for, for running his mouth. Davis defended Lee and defended him to the media. He also defended them to Governor Pickens from South Carolina, Francis Pickens, who hated him. But you know what he did? He put Lee in charge of the coastal defenses in South Carolina, Mm -hmm. as well as Georgia and Florida, and said, this is my guy. I know you don't like him, but this this is the guy we're sticking with. He's going to do it. And Lee is going to stay there in these coastal defenses, and he's going to learn his lessons and think about it during that entire time. So when the opportunity comes again for the take command on June 1st, 1862, when ironically Joseph E. Johnson shot at Seven Pines, mm. this is a very different Robert E. Lee now from the one who went stumbling into the mountains in 1861 had those experiences at Sheep Mountain. So Robert E. Lee, when you study him, you realize he started at the bottom. He started not screwed very well. Up, screwed up. The media hated him. That The men didn't like him so much. And then... He got another chance, but he learned, and then he mm-hmm. turned into Robert E. Lee. But it surprises a lot of people. Robert E. Lee wasn't Robert E. Lee at the beginning. He no, was exactly. He, he was. He was more Braxton Bragg than Robert E. Lee at the beginning. He was, and not a lot of them were. I mean, Sherman screws up at the beginning as well. He has his breakdown at uh, at one point early in the Civil War. Grant has his moments and all that. Like these guys, and of course, my General Howard has. I mean, well, though people don't think Howard grew and learned, but he did. Listen to our episode about that. Um, but yeah, these guys all, a lot of them learn from their mistakes. And Lee is clearly a guy who did. Lee was also a guy that, and I can respect him for this. He owns it. He's like, this was my fault. Like, I know what I did wrong here kind of thing, right? Um, but that's what's very interesting and why it's important to study a battle like Cheat Mountain because it shows you who Robert E. Lee was before. He was the Robert E. Lee that, you know, kind of the popular culture, the one we know from the movie Gettysburg was. Uh-huh. Right, it was, but he got the beard in the mountains because he couldn't shave. He didn't have time to shave. Interesting. He just kept it. He stuck it, so there we go. Interesting. I, so I think it's a good place to drop off with there that. There is think, one think... more thing I want to talk about, though, before oh, we okay. go. Um, and that is what happened to Kimball after Cheat Mountain. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, that's right. Because Kimball's an interesting figure in the Civil War. He's kind of a guy that does not get talked about a lot, but he's there at the very beginning at this battle of Cheat Mountain, and he's also there at the end as well. So after he defeats, you can, it is considered, he does defeat Robert E. Lee. It is considered that he defeats Stonewall Jackson at the Battle of Kernstown, which we did an episode about that. Um, And after this, he gets promoted to Brigadier General. So Colonel Nathan Kimball becomes General Nathan Kimball. Um, In the Maryland campaign, he fights at Antietam. He leads the 1st Brigade of French's division in desperate fighting at the Sunken Road. He's able to take the road, but he's going to lose over 600 men killed or wounded there. He commands what is known as the Gibraltar Gibraltar Brigade, 
Um, they're named for their ability to stand and fight even under intense enemy fire. At the Battle of Fredericksburg, he's wounded at Mary's Heights, and he is forced to rest through the winter and spring of 1863. And at this point, he, you know, he misses the Battle of Gettysburg. He goes out to the Western Theater. Um, actually, no, it's before this. Sorry, because he will command... Um, a division during the siege of Vicksburg and was then moved to being under the command of General Sherman. He's involved in the Atlanta campaign and then he ends up getting moved back to Indiana. This is really interesting. He ends up getting moved back to Indiana for a short period of time because he needs to suppress. He's told to go suppress a group known as the Knights of the Golden Circle, which um, there is some legend that John Wilkes Booth was connected to them, um, apparently. But anyway, they're this kind of group that Kimball's told go to go to suppress them for whatever reason and he's back in time for the battles of Franklin and Nashville so near the very end of the Civil War after the Civil War he's the state treasurer in Indiana and then he held several political appointments in Utah Territory he's appointed as postmaster of of Ogden Utah by President Rutherford B. Hayes and in 1869 he will join the Freemasons Lodge in Mount Pleasant, Indiana so that is Kimball is kind of this, he's probably kind of the, I don't, because they don't, it's not a huge battle, but they're, the rock star of this is probably Kimball for what, what he does there. Um, it's not, you know, it's not like a battle of Gettysburg or whatever, but he's kind of the prominent name that comes out of this. And he does, he does kind of take with him, like, I defeated Robert E. Lee and I defeated Stonewall Jackson. Yeah, he's he's one of those guys in history, especially Kernstown when he, when he really fought. But this this is this is an, an, an interesting one because more deception than anything else. Yes, like yeah, he, he I think he probably told those pickets, "We'll tell them you got like five thousand guys up here." Yeah, they pulled it off. They pulled yeah. it off. All right, so I guess we can drop it now. Uh, I think you know what's interesting about Sheet Mountain is there's mm-hmm. a lot more about the western part of Virginia. We're going to do a separate episode, maybe even with the guest Mary, to talk about West Virginia next yes. time. Yes. We'll, we'll we'll see about that, but um, we're going to talk more about that going forward. But but again, it's a it's a good part. We talked a lot about the genesis of some of these guys, and to find out to look at Robert e. Lee's early days that he doesn't just appear the seven days. He, he, there's this there's a story before yeah. that, and and like anything else, you can teach an old dog new tricks because he definitely does learn from his experiences at Cheat Mountain. He always maintained that macro manager thing. Like mm-hmm. we saw at Gettysburg with the echelon attack yeah. and that take the hill and all that stuff. But um, but again, he he learned, and I think if, if he had it to do over again, he probably would have been a little more forceful and wearing. I get yeah. they were sick, but I think he realized that when 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 the opportunity is there, you're gonna take advantage of it. And mm-hmm. I think that's I think his experience here is why he was very aggressive at Chancellorsville. I think, mm-hmm. I think that, I think you, I think you can look and see how all the dominoes kind of fall. Yeah. Most of Lee's attacks, if you go off a tangent now, are the same. Yeah. We're going to hit, the, hit the flank. Yeah. Second Manassas, he did it. Gettysburg, he did it. Chancellorsville, he did it. He's it like the Sherman same in that plan. way. He, he, he does right. the same thing over and over again. But I think the, the thing here is that he learned from what happened I, I think so. and that is so much like what you see with the good generals the great generals of the civil war you see it with uh-huh. grant you know you see it with pat claiborne as well i know he's not an army commander but pat claiborne is a guy that learns from his mistakes and that's what the, you know the ones that kind of come out on top are the ones that learn but also too they're the ones that had had failures at the beginning you look at someone okay. like sherman someone like grant oliver otis howard All of them. Um, Another parallel I kind of drew was with uh, Buford, of all people. Buford was a guy that didn't really get the command he wanted until close, like, you know, kind of midway through the war. Like Lee, he was a desk person. He never advocated for himself. And people kept saying, you need to advocate. You're really good. And he never did it. And then he finally, Buford finally got that command he wanted. And thankfully he did, because there he is at Gettysburg, right? You got him. So a very similar situation. Yes, it is. It's all like a circular. Okay, so what's coming up for us next? What's new? So our next episode is going to be um, to do with the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga. We're going to be focusing um, an episode. Um, we're going to be zeroing in on Minty and Wilder and what they did on the first day. Now, almost three years ago, we did do an episode on the Battle of Chickamauga. We did a two-parter where we did talk a little bit about them. But we're going to be talking a little bit about them in more detail, probably more their backgrounds, what they did there. We've both now been there to Chickamauga, down to Alexander's Bridge, where where Wilder was, 
to see that ground um, and all that. And another great book about that, also written by um, Wittenberg, who you mentioned at the beginning, is Holding the Line at the River of Death, which is about Minty and Wilder. So if any of y'all want to read that before our episode, <laughs> might be a good one. It is something. It is something. But looking forward to it. So we got our live coming up tomorrow. Yeah. Some fun stuff coming up. Also, Ooh, thanks to everybody train. who came out for our roundtable. We were back again after like a two-month hiatus. Thank you to everybody. It was a great discussion. Lots of Western theater, book discussion, all that. It was awesome. You guys are great for coming and hanging out with us. It was. It was. All right. I guess we can drop it up here, Mary. So this, this is a fun episode. So definitely uh, hope you enjoy this one. I think it's a lot of fun um, looking at the parts of the, of the war that aren't really the big the big well, spot. Well, they really you, you, shine the light on more of what you see in the bigger battles and why – the decisions were made um you know at at that time like they might have factored into something that happened to you know the reason why might have been something that happened before right that's why it's important to study these smaller earlier battles okay well off we go so mary again the pleasure as as always is all yours so everybody else have a great long safe weekend enjoy your college football this weekend i'm my my bc eagles are undefeated mary for at least another 24 hours probably it's like Friggin' probably lose again, but it's okay. So we're going to enjoy it while we can. The weather is cooling off this fall. There's pumpkin beer in the air, Mary. Pumpkin spice has taken over the planet. So we are going to enjoy this. Enjoy the season. Fall is the best. Hopefully it is cool where you are. Hopefully it is dry, unlike Western Virginia, where it rained for 22 straight days. Nope. And we're thankfully, I did not hear, have to hear from Darren during that. Time. No, that's probably that's probably a good thing. Anyway, all right, guys. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. We will talk to you all on the other side. See you all soon. Bye. Peace out.